evening day walkers and night stalkers it is me your twisted southern horror queen i've been debating the uh, universe with paul daniels and jimmy bell and god help us all that's a tragic thought right there but anyway yes it's me your twisted southern horror queen and i'm coming to you live from under a full moon right here in southeastern louisiana where it's cold as ass i don't like cold y'all but i'm glad y'all are hanging out with me tonight because i got some creepy crazy tales for you folks and speaking of creepy gotta give that big shout out to my producer jimmy bell and his demented cohort paul daniels who are hanging out with me in boston massachusetts as we speak they're handling all the techie bullshit back behind the scenes working vigilantly through a fat fog of cannabis smoke uh by the way check out paul and jimmy's show pot talk here on armed radio every thursday night followed by night talk with joe rocks and in between my show and theirs on wednesday nights is big johnny blenders whiskey cars and cigars and my boy glenn spillman brings it on with sports insider now glenn does a double header on fridays he comes in and does 13 uh seller 13 films and then a new episode of uh, <clears throat> Sports Insider. So he's a very busy boy. And if you're into acting or indie filmmaking or uh, stunt guy work or anything along those lines, you really should be following Glenn. He knows his shit. And you can learn a whole lot from that show. I've actually learned from him listening as well. So big shout out to you, big boy. Hey, Freddie's in the house. I got Freddie, I got Kenya, I got Ronnie and Lori Owens. Big boy Johnny Blender also stalking me from downstairs because it's too damn cold out in the shop. All right, so got to also give a big shout out to the Adrian Fury Dragster sponsors, Surreal Studios, DM Graphics, Renegade Racing Fuel, MLA Oil, and of course, my personal favorite, Naked Wines. You drink enough of this shit, eventually you will wind up naked, I promise. I'm expecting the sound of large footsteps coming up the stairs any moment now after having said that. Um, also got to give a shout out to my boy, the moonshine man, Wade Cuevas, who's further corrupting me and Big Johnny Blender by supplying us with some badass Pearl River County moonshine. That may actually be Hancock County. I'm not sure, but then some Mississippi boys know what they're doing around us still. Yeah. All right. So. Just to let you know, um, the Adrian Trilogy series is still in reproduction as we speak. Volume 1 is due to be re-released here real shortly in just a few short weeks. Uh, volume 2 is almost finished. We're just lacking covers on those. and actually cracked the book open on Legacy, which is the third uh, volume of the uh, Adrian Trilogy series. So I'm looking forward to that. Just waiting for my contract release to come from my present publisher, Any day now um so with all that madness out of the way it's time to kick out the kids lock the doors dim the lights and grab that tasty adult beverage because we about to get our scary on around here oh that's awesome hey geo george nice to see you and john bearing my honey i haven't seen you in a long time happy new year to you i hope everything's going very well for you all right, so tonight I'm starting out with something that is near and dear to my heart. Actually, it's near and dear to my feet. Um, you guys that know me well know that I am a shoe whore, self-professed. Um, I can lose my freaking mind over a Victoria's Secret closeout sale. But tonight I'm going to talk about a real shoe freak. What's the difference? You'll see in just a minute. So this dude, Jerome Brudos, had a serious shoe fetish when he was a kid. The problem was he liked women's shoes and underwear, like a whole lot, like, right. Um, but somewhere down the line, this dude just went completely apeshit. Um, it all started out when he was a little boy and he finds his high heeled shoe out of a local junkyard. Now, I don't know what a little kid's doing rummaging around in a junkyard, but, um, that kind of gives you a little bit of insight to his childhood right there, doesn't he? So anyway, he was freaking fascinated with this shoe. So he takes it home with him, kind of like a trophy. And that's kind of where his demented criminal escapades kicked off. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I'm thinking this had to be one badass pump right here. Anyway, so this 
freak of nature was born in 1939 in South Dakota. He was the youngest of two boys. Now, not unlike many other serial killers, Brutus had this twisted kind of relationship with his mother. Um, his mom had hoped for a daughter, but instead she winds up with this sinister Al Bundy type kid. Um, so she nags at the kid constantly throughout his childhood, and she's always telling him what a burden he was and what a screw up he was. So when she started a ranting, Brutus would retreat into his freaked out little fantasy world. Well, at some point, he decides he's going to go ahead and start acting out these uh, demented fantasies, I guess would be a good word. But uh, that's when he starts stealing women's shoes and underwear from the neighbor's houses right there in his neighborhood. That's awesome. Hey, Wade Cuevas, I just gave you a shout out and you were tardy. But another shout out to you. Thanks for that moonshine, honey. I love it. Hey, Jason, good to see you tonight. Thanks for hanging with me. So anyway, um, it didn't take him very long before his twisted little fetish started turning violent. So he loses his shit when he hits 17. He threatens this chick with a knife and he forces her to take her clothes off. Well, he, most folks would think right there, yeah, this poor little girl just got raped. Not so much. Um, Brutus took a few pictures of her standing there butt naked and then he hauls ass with her clothes. I told you he was a freak of nature. Anyway, um, a few days later, he winds up getting busted for it, and they ship his demented little ass off to the Oregon State Hospital psychiatric ward for the next nine months. But these asshats were actually letting him out during the day to go to school. I doubt seriously that he went to school every day. However, he did wind up graduating with his high school class, and he went on to become a mechanical and electrical engineer. So at that point, everybody's thinking, well, he's leveled off and he's kind of normal now. And I guess the psychiatric ward was just what he needed. Well, he only seemed kind of normal after that. Uh, four years later, he winds up getting married. And then, of course, as it happens, two kids come later. Brutus buys this house in the suburbs of Salem, Oregon, where everybody around him is convinced that he's just an everyday guy. But lurking beneath his average Joe persona was a violent monster with a twisted fetish for women's underwear and shoes. You see, old boy had a workroom attached to his house that nobody was allowed to enter. He always kept it locked up. And that's where he let his crazy out. So during the early to mid 60s, Brutus kept it to a minimum, uh, only some light stalking and random beatings here and there. But in 1968, he killed his first victim. Uh, Linda Slauson was a door to door salesman. Uh, she was peddling encyclopedias. Remember how they used to do that back in the day? Nobody even knows what a freaking encyclopedia is anymore. But anyway, this encyclopedia salesman knocked on the wrong door. Brutus decides he's going to let her in. He locks the door behind her, and then he strangles her to death. So after she's dead, he drags her into her, his workroom, where he kept her for a while, so he could kind of dress up the corpse as he saw fit, changing out shoes and dressing her in lingerie and whatever else he could find laying around. Well, eventually, as they do, the corpse started to stink, so he's got to get rid of it, right? Well, before he dumps it in the river, he hacks off one of her feet to use it in modeling other high-heeled shoes that he would bring home with him. <laughs> Got to be a Hallmark card in that, right? So anyway, later the same year, he's off, uh, he offs this college student named Jan Whitney. Um, instead of taking her body back to the workroom, he carves off his breast, her breast at the uh, murder scene and takes them back with, with him and dumps the body in the river. Uh, the following year, he strikes two more times. Brutus murdered Karen Sprinker and Linda Saley. Um, these two he brought back with him and he dressed them up in lingerie and heels for as long as he could tolerate the stench. And of course, when they started smelling funky, they were dumped into the same river with the other victims. So on May 10th in 1969, this fisherman finds one of those bodies floating around in the Long Tom River. It was Linda Saley. Um, two days later, the police divers find Karen Sprinker's corpse. Both of the women had been tied to car parts and dumped into the river so they would sink. 
Uh, let's see who else we got in the house tonight. We got Gio George saying, saying something in Spanish. I'm sorry, honey. Me no comprendo. <laughs> and China, good to see you. I'm glad you're joining us tonight. So anyway, um, the police start questioning Sprinker's friends over at the university. And they all start realizing that they had these phone calls from this dude that keeps saying that he's a lonely Vietnam vet. He's only looking for a date for, you know, just somebody to hang out with. Um, and one of these chicks had actually accepted a date from him. And she tells the detectives that when she showed up and they're eating dinner, the dude was acting kind of crazy. So uh, she was kind of inching her way out the door. And apparently he saw that she wasn't interested. But he did have the balls to ask her how she knew that he'd take her back home instead of taking her to the river and strangling her. So the police talk to this chick and they convince her that she needs to try to set up another date with him so they could nab him and ask him a few questions. Well, she agreed and so they're sitting out there waiting for him. Well, when Bruto shows up for his date, they had a whole bunch of detectives sitting there waiting. <clears throat> so they nab him up, take him to the police station, and they question him and they wind up having to release him because he's got a pretty good cover story. But the popo knew something was up, right? So they start looking into him, and they go back to question this chick that has, had escaped uh, an attempted abduction somewhere between 1968 and 69. She comes back to the police department and identifies uh, Brutus as her assailant. So now Popo's got a reason to go get them a search warrant and check out Brutus' home at Salem, and that's exactly what they did. Hey, Lawrence, glad to see you, my honey. So the officers searched Bruto's home and his secret off-limits workroom where they found some pretty damning evidence, like a set of boobs and some shoes and some nylon rope and photos of all the dead women that he had dressed up in all these clothes and they were modeling for him, um, along with some other gruesome mementos. So when Brutus was confronted with the crimes, he actually admitted to four murders and he was arrested on May 25th in 1969. At least he had the balls to plead guilty and he did get life. Uh, Brutus died in 2006, which actually made him Oregon's longest serving inmate. So I thought that was kind of crazy. Glenn Spillman was just talking about you, honey. Hope all is well. My heart goes out to you, my love. We need to hook up because I'm trying to hook you up with another little actor dude over there somewhere in your area if he hasn't reached out yet. But we'll talk about that when you're ready. All right. So from a murderer with a serious freaking shoe fetish to a very, very old English ghost legend that I ran across. Um, when I read it, I just knew I had to share this with you guys. So I hope you all enjoy it. It's kind of off the path from what I normally do, but I really liked it. I thought you'd think it was cool. So there was this old church with a belfry that stood kind of to its side. Now it was a, I don't want to say ugly, but they say an unattractive octagon shaped construction that only had two rooms inside. The entire bottom floor was considered one room and above it was the rope room. Not considered a room was a small vault that was beneath the main level where they usually kept lumber and other supplies that they may need to do repairs or whatever. So the old guys that were in charge of ringing this bell all had a firm belief that this belfry was haunted, but nobody in that group would ever talk about it. And when they were asked, they would all have this same weird expression on their face that said, we know something, but we ain't talking. So there was only one that actually spilled his guts and told somebody what he saw. And it was said in that legend that he lost his mind after he relayed his uh, encounter. So I thought that was interesting, but so none of these old guys would go into the belfry after uh, dark and whether it was day or night, not one of them would ever venture into the vault. So along comes this younger generation. It's a group of local dudes from the same area that were being trained to care for the belfry and how to learn the bell to ring the bells. Now it's a little bit more complicated now because everything's mechanical you mash a button these days or you program some software wasn't like that back in the day everybody had to know when to pull what rope and all that good shit i guess you guys could figure that out though um <clears throat> so none of these young guys believed that the old dudes had their uh, right mind when they were saying that this belfry was haunted um 
they laughed it off and called all the old guys superstitious. And even though they didn't believe in the legends, not one of them bothered to venture down into that vault. Most of them wound up spending most of their time there at the Belfry in the rope room. Now, this Belfry was creepy as hell, even during the daytime. The exterior was all beat up and weather scarred and the interior was dank and uninviting, all musty and dusty and all that good stuff. There were these long, narrow stained glass windows on the ground floor that went all the way up to the rope room. But the glass was covered with so much dust that the sun wasn't even able to filter through. So now you've got a pretty good idea how creepy this joint was. I'm going to tell you the best part of the legend. So it's New Year's Eve at 11 o'clock and a group of these young bell ringers show up at the belfry and they're ready to toll the bells at midnight. They're all sitting around on a bench in the rope room and they're waiting for midnight to hit. Now all of these guys have been out partying. Um, they were all for the most part pretty messed up um, and they're sitting there passing time on these benches and they're still passing the bottle around. So they're pretty well lit, right? So as they're talking, they realize that they're missing the party because they're the ones that's obligated to ring these dumbass bells at midnight. So they start joking around about how lame the tradition was, and then the conversation turns to the crazy old man that thought the belfry was haunted, right? Well, the youngest of these inebriated little punks, his name was John Greaves. Um, he was also said to be one of the most wasted of the group, too. Well, this little dude grabs a candle and he heads off down the stairs. The other guys were so trashed, they didn't even notice that he'd left. Well, John was off to prove a point. Now, whether or, or not he would have considered his next move while he was sober is anybody's guess, but drunky drunk decides he's going to go down to the vault and prove that there wasn't anything going on there. Wrong move, slick, right? So... He stumbles down the stone steps and he reaches a small landing and he pushes the heavy door open and he enters this vault. He found that, of course, the room was empty. It was a, a square-shaped cell, very dark because there were no windows down there. Um, the ground was a flagged floor and the walls were covered with a really thick layer of dust and cobwebs. looked like something from the Adams family. Uh, I would dig that. But uh, the floor, I couldn't have the floor all dirty. But that's cool because one of the notes in this legend says that it looked like the floor had been recent, recently swept. And I'm leaving that in there because I think it might make some sense a little bit later on. So the, um, the one thing that he noted first off when he walked in there is that the room was just freezing freaking cold. So seeing that there was no ghost hanging out there in the vault, Grief starts kind of laughing it off, and he heads back to the door to go join the rest of his drunk friends upstairs. But as soon as he turns, this ice-cold gust of wind blows from out of nowhere and, and blows his candle out. So he takes one more step forward towards where he thinks the door is supposed to be, and he stumbles on something. Well, he's so freaking trashed, he can't get up off the floor. So instead of trying to crawl back up the stairs, he rolls over against the wall and just kind of passes out for the rest of the night. So while he's asleep, he has this weird dream. Now in his dream, he said that he woke up to find himself in the vault. And of course it was pitch black and he didn't know how in the hell he got down there. But all of a sudden, as he's kind of coming to consciousness, he hears these heavy footsteps on the stone steps. And he looks up and he sees these two uh, monks in uh, black habits come walking toward him. One of them's carrying a lantern. Now, the monks were acting like they didn't even see him. It was obvious he was there. It's a very small room. But they just walked on by like he wasn't there. So uh, they walk to the center of the room and all of a sudden they start prying up one of the large flags with this iron bar. Well, underneath that flag rock was a square hole. So the monks start descending through the opening and Greaves could actually hear the scraping sound of their feet as they're, they're going down these steps. So he starts freaking the hell out. He's pinned as close to that damn wall as he could get. And he's listening so intently at the, what these monks are doing down that hole that he was hardly even breathing. So he could hear them talking, but he couldn't really make out what they were saying. And after uh, they stopped talking, he hears the unmistakable sound of a pick and a shovel working the soil down there. So 
Eventually, curiosity overcame his fear, and he crawls over to the opening, and he peeks down in there to see what's going on. So he sees one of the monks that's digging a hole, and the other one's leaning over what appeared to be the corpse of another monk in his black habit with his hood up. So Greaves has his oh shit moment, and he clambers back over to the wall, but he's still listening. Uh, eventually, the digging stops, and then all of a sudden, he hears this dull thud. Of course, the corpse had been thrown into the hole at that point. So after that, he hears this voice. It was clear and distinct, and it said, Requiem Antornatum Dona Es Domini, it said. Uh, et Lutz Perpetua Lucia Es, another voice responded. He realized at that moment that the monks were reciting a burial service. So after all that, he hears the shovels go back to work. Well, it was around that time he woke himself up babbling something incoherent, and he rolls back over to face the wall and goes to sleep. Well, midnight had come and gone, and the bells didn't even wake this dude up. It was nearly daybreak when something cold and damp brushed across his face. So he leans up against the wall, rubs his eyes, and looks around, and it takes him a minute before he realizes where the hell he's at, right? But he still didn't have any freaking idea how he got down there. So he starts fumbling around in his pockets and he finds a match and he finds his candle and he gets it lit. Well, as he's sitting there, this dream of his comes back vividly in his mind. So he takes the candle and he starts looking around at the floor and he's looking for one of these flagstones that has a ring on it because they had used a, a bar to pry it up. So he's assuming there's a ring on it. Well, by now he's sober and his head's freaking pounding, but he was still compelled to keep looking. So suddenly the largest flagstone in the center of the room starts rising up on its own, and then it fell away from the hole, but it made no noise. Greaves could see the square hole that it had been covering up, just like in his dream. Well, a moment later after that, this monk in a dirty black habit emerges from that hole. The skin on his face was stretched tightly across his bones, kind of like parchment paper. There was no flesh anywhere on this dude. He said his eyes were missing, yet his sockets were glowing deep beneath his hood, and in his hand he carried a wooden crucifix. This monk, just like the other two, didn't really seem to notice him sitting there, so John watched on as he mouthed something that appeared to resemble some kind of prayer, yet no sound came from his gaping mouth. So the monk walks across the floor and then passed through the closed door. At that point, John's got the balls to get up and go follow him. So the monk passes across the ground floor and he starts up the stairs to the uh, rope room. Well, when he reached for the rope that was attached to the tenor bell, he began pulling on it. Well, John saw this rope moving with his own eyes, but the bell never made a sound. Now, for you guys that don't know, the tenor bell is a bell that's rung to signify somebody's passing. So the poor bastard was actually up there ringing the death bell for himself. Well, John had seen enough, so he hauls ass away from the belfry, and he never went back. A week later, a priest actually uh, was surprised to receive an envelope that contained two sovereigns and a note that requested him to say masses for the repose of a soul of an unknown monk. Now, John Greaves never told anybody what he'd seen until many, many years later. He was walking to town with his family on the same road where this church in Belfry stood. All of a sudden, this procession of monks passes and all their heads are bowed. Well, the last one in line raises his head to acknowledge him. And John was face to face with the same ghost of the monk that he'd encountered in the Belfry. That very same day, the Belfry was destroyed by fire. So whether or not the monk was an omen or John freaked the hell out and decided he was going to burn the bitch down himself, one or the other. But I just thought that was a really cool story, and I hope it uh, sent a couple shivers down some of you guys' spines. Tommy Reese, Charles Watts, David Harmon, Joe Savino is gracing me with his presence tonight. David Goday, Tim and Donna Hatton are here, and my girl Susie Jones. Thank all of you guys for tuning in. I'm so glad that you're here tonight. Stacy says, you're a great storyteller, Lynn. Thank you for sharing. Thanks, Stacy. I appreciate that. Um, let's see if something else I've got here is going to hook you guys up tonight. David Bloodrain, good to see you tonight, too, my man. Okay, 
So there are still plenty of minutes left for some more Haunted Tales. That's cool, because I'm going to tell you guys about the Knoll House in Seven Oaks. Um, this sucker was built in the late 15th century, and it's one of the oldest and largest homes in West Kent. Locals like to refer to it as the Calendar House because it's got 365 rooms, 52 staircases, and 12 entrances. At least the original version did, but you got to keep in mind it's been there for a few hundred years. It's been renovated more than once, so things change. I'm sure there's more than 365 rooms now. Okay, so um, the oldest parts of this house were built between 1456 and 1486 by Thomas Bouchier, which, the, which was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, it was started on the site of where an earlier house was that had belonged to James Fiennes, who was executed after the victory of Jack Cade's rebels at the Battle of Soul Fields. So it didn't really have happy beginnings as it was. Now, this house had been in the possession of the Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, along with a laundry list of other notable names. Um, among them is the Black Knight, or as he was otherwise known, Richard Sackfield, who was the uh, third Earl of Dorset between 1598 and 1624. Um, now, Sackfield, he was a player, that's for sure. <laughs> He's left a legacy behind him. So he kind of liked rubbing elbows with the royal family and everybody else who was up there in that social circle. And it pretty much looks to me that his struggle with keeping up with the Joneses just wore his ass out. Now that combined with a serious gambling problem, that's the blame for his demise. In fact, uh, one of the largest losses that he was ever recorded that he was involved with was to King James I, where Sackville lost 400 pieces of gold to that king in a bet. Popped in to say hi. Good to see you, Rhonda. I saw schools are closed tomorrow. Dear God. Ramesh, nice to see you too. So, um, they've done a little bit of remodeling there, and I saw a couple of articles. I didn't write all of it down but I will share with you now that they found trunks of uh, letters, correspondences in between the subfloor and the decking of the attic in this house. And some of them dated back into the late 16th and early 17th century. Uh, normal everyday correspondence, kind of cool to see stuff like that. Um, also, one of the things that they found there, uh, this was in 2014. They found demon traps carved into the floorboards of the Knoll House, particularly beneath the fireplaces. Um, these archaic carvings or, or sketches or whatever form they're used out to do or, or used to make uh, are supposed to ward off demons and witches. Now, whether or not they, tr they do or not, who knows? I haven't done a whole lot of investigating in that. However, with him being so closely acquainted with King James, it's well known that the dude was terrified and fascinated with both the demonic and with witchcraft. So my thoughts, along with several other authorities, not that I'm throwing my hat in the ring to be one of the authorities, um, that Sir Richard had those demon traps installed or carved before King James came to visit him there. So, like we said, we know King James was intrigued and terrified of witchcraft and other dark forces. He'd be terrified of me. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't long after that period then uh, when he started with his witch hunts. Now, let me drop just a little bit of knowledge on you. I was talking with Paul Daniels and uh, Jim Bell just before the show started. We were actually getting a heated conversation. Uh, no, not really, not heated, but very deep conversation about the Bible, and of course, King James is a big player in that, doesn't make me a happy chick, but uh, one of the things that he did when uh, he was looking for his witches, there were a couple of tests that he had, and one of them in particular was to take the accused and cuff a ball and chain to their ankle, and then throw them into the nearest body of water. If they floated, they were a witch. If they sank, they were innocent, and they died innocently. What a freaking moron! Well, it wasn't exactly that he was a moron. It's because King James had acquired some raging STD, and he lost his freaking mind. So, while he's all crazy, apeshit, insane, 
He's overseeing the translation and the rescribing of the King James Version. So God only knows what, uh, what is not corrupted that's in there because he pretty much dictated what he wanted in the book and what he did not want in the book. And the scribes that were there in his employ had better do exactly as he said, else they'd wind up next to an accused witch in the bottom of a lake or burning at the stake. So the Bible is now what we know today as the Bible, as what King James' vision of the Bible was for the folks back in those days. Okay, rant over. Let's see if I can get back on this story right here. So anyway, like we were talking about his uh, wonderful witch tests, um, we'll leave that out. We may do a little segment on him in a couple weeks. So anyway, uh, well, let's talk about Sir Richard's ghost now. So... Sir Richard died at the age of 35, which is fairly young these days, but I guess and he had a pretty stressful life. He was broke as hell, and he still owed a tremendous gambling debt. In today's terms, he was in the hole about 70 grand, and he'd lost all of his estates and pretty much everything else he owned. Uh, even though he had been forced to sell the Knoll House, along with his other properties and his belongings, it seemed like he never actually left. Um, the Black Knight is still seen there on the property today. It's said that if and when he's wandered around the older parts of this house, that you should be paying attention because something bad's fixing to happen. But when times are good, Sir Richard can be seen riding on horseback around the grounds and kind of blending in with the shadows being cost, uh, cast from the trees right there around the massive home. Now, of course, he's not the only ghost that's still seen there. With a house that's that old, there's got to be a shit ton of ghosts hanging out there, right? Of course. But we're going to talk about one other one in particular, because I think it's funny as shit. His wife, Lady Anne Clifford, is still said to walk the dark avenue of chestnut oak and oak trees um, around the north side of the Knowles Grand Gatehouse. Unfortunately for the Black Knight, she's destined to nag his ass for all eternity. Kind of like Johnny Blender. Her marriage was very troubled, to say the least, so Sir Richard's interest in her was based solely on how much money her estates could generate in order to fund his lavish lifestyle. Well, old girl didn't take a whole lot of shit off of him. She dealt with him the same way that a lot of us women would deal with our men today. She invaded his wardrobe and took his finest clothes and had her staff cut them up to make furniture fabric. Now, if you ask me, he got off easy. This poor chick had to endure the shame of his indebted legacy for another entire 52 years. Locals believe that it's her sheer hatred of this man that has kept her spirit at the Knoll House for all these years. Kind of sounds like a nice place to visit, right? So anyway, we're uh, rolling right along, and I'm going to tell you about a few really well-known horror movies next that were inspired by real folks and true happenings. Um, I think you're going to find some of this pretty freaking interesting. Uh, Susan said, we might, we had nothing to do with that, my story, and I'm sticking to it. I say that frequently. Hey, Stephen, talk about the Book of Enoch. Yes, that's an entire show or two or three, that's for sure. Brian Reed, nice to see you in the house. Thank you, Lawrence. I appreciate that, my man. Okay, so the First film that was actually based on a true story, The Hills Have Eyes. Oh, yeah. This 1977 Wes Craven flick was based on a group of Scottish degenerates known as the Sawney Bean Clan. You guys are going to love this shit. So this is one of Scotland's most shocking and gruesome legends. This tale kicks off in East Lothian, which... Uh, this dude named Shawnee Bean, or Sawney Bean, he was a ditch digger by trade. It was pretty much the family business from what I can see. Well, one day he decides he didn't really want any part of the family business anymore. In fact, he didn't really dig hard labor at all. Catch that pun there? That was pretty cool, huh? So he packs up his shit and he heads to the southwest coast. Well, after he hauls ass, he winds up in South Ayrshire, where he hooks up with this chick known as Black Agnes Douglas. Well, Black Agnes had kind of a similar distaste for labor as Bean, so they set up residence together in this cave somewhere between Gravine and Ballantrae. 
So for 25 years, they called this place home. And during that 25 years, they created a seriously demented family. By the time they were finished, there were 45 of them in the Bean Clan. Folks, there was some serious uncle cousin shit going on right there in that little cave. And with all that inbreeding, the result was something a lot less than socialized mankind, let me tell you. So uh, <laughs> this band of inbreeds had to have some kind of way to support themselves, right? Because they definitely weren't farming and none of them was getting a job, right? So like I said, Bean had given up the ditch digging gig, Black Agnes wasn't getting her hands dirty and none of the other little inbred idiots were able to hold a job anyway. So for 25 years, these two, and their twisted little offspring survived off ambushing these travelers. Um, they would murder them, then drag the carcasses back to their cave. Now, it would kind of make sense to me if they were robbing them and selling their stolen property, um, but apparently that wasn't the case. They were taking the uh, victims back to the cave to eat their asses. <laughs> I guess it would have just taken too much of an effort to haul their stolen goods to town and try to hawk them, right? So they never bothered doing that. But what they did do was dismember and eat their victims, sometimes cooked, sometimes not. I guess it depended on their mood. Um, some parts were saved and pickled. Some were hanged up and turned into jerky. Very little of their victims was ever left over, but those spare parts were all dumped into the sea. Well, when body parts start washing up on the beaches of these surrounding towns, folks started paying attention to what the hell was going on around them. So they sent this lynch mob out because somebody was going to pay for all that madness, right? Well, even though the beans were crazy, they weren't stupid. They managed to stay hidden, and the attention of the mob and the supervising authorities was directed onto a group of local vagrants. These two bastards were just torn apart. They were used as scapegoats and lynch just to appease all these infuriated locals. I hate that for them. Um, anyway, despite all the safeguards that uh, the Bean Clan had taken in remaining undetected and staying hidden for all those years, as it will, their luck changed one day. So there was this young couple that was walking back from a local fair and they just walked directly into the path of some of the bean deviants that were out scouting for dinner that day, I suppose. Um, at first, they brutally murdered the woman, and then they turned on the man. Well, this dude was a little bit better equipped to defend himself than all these past victims they'd uh, run into. So he's fighting with them tooth and nail and manages to hold them all off until this uh, other crowd of people who had been at the same fair start coming up close to him. Well, the beans freak out because they don't want to be spotted by anybody, and now they're going to have a survivor. So they haul ass back to the, the cave. Well, some of the people from this group that had just walked up, of course, they're checking on the, the dude's wife. They're checking on him. But the other ones hauled ass after the beans. And they stayed on their tail long enough to see where they disappeared into. So now everybody knows where these sick bastards have been hiding, right? So this search party of over 400 men with bloodhounds that was said to be led by King James IV of Scotland takes off on a mission, right? It wasn't long after that and they were standing at the mouth of the cave. Now they were there and they were ready to kick some ass and drag some freaks back to town, but what they weren't ready for was the gruesome scene of gore and filth that they were about to walk into. The stench was unbearable. Yet all 45 of the Bean Clan were calling this cesspool home. The walls of the cave were spattered in blood. The stone floors were stained even worse. There were random body parts hanging from the walls and jars of pickled body parts laying around everywhere. Large sections of human skin were stretched over rocks, drying, I guess to be used as clothing. <laughs> human leather, right? So anyway, like I said, all the possessions of these victims were scattered all around in piles all over the place. That shows you what inbreeding will do right there. Because why well, throw away the unused body parts and not bother to get, a, get rid of all the evidence as well? Who the hell am I to argue with their tactics, though? Because they got away with this bullshit for 25 years. Brent Cummins in the house. Good to see you tonight, honey. All right. 
So eventually the lynch mob winds up gathering all the Bean Clan deviants together and they chain them up and they drag them to Edinburgh where they're waiting for their execution. Now it's documented that all the women and children of the clan were burned at the stake. The men were all dismembered and left to bleed to death. Kind of a fitting demise if you ask me. Oh, by the way, did I mention that I'm a supporter of capital punishment? Oh my God, I just heard some liberals out there swallowing their tongues. <laughs> Let me tell you folks, there's way worse things out there than capital punishment ever heard of redneck justice so on our next film inspired by real folks or real events the town that dreaded sundown which originally debuted in the 1970s and then there was the 2014 remake they were both based on true shit y'all the actual crime file is known as the texarkana murders hey frederick that's good stuff I, i'm glad you enjoy that freddie's into cannibalism or was it the whole capital punishment thing? Um, anyway, the true story behind the movie is just as terrifying as anything that was created for the theaters. Uh, and this case has remained unsolved for over 70 years now. That means this dude was somebody's neighbor or husband or father while he's out raping and murdering. Yeah, all of you little folks living in your subdivisions right now, why don't y'all get up real quick and close the blinds so your neighbors can't be watching you. Go ahead. We'll sit here and wait for you. All right. So all this madness is going down in Texarkana in 1946. Now the law dogs on every side of these state lines were trying to work together and figure out who in the hell this phantom slayer was. So as they're sniffing around looking for clues, the attacks raged on and the body count started to rise. The rumors were elevated to an urban legend status there. So this dude's thing was to sneak up on young couples that were parked at the end of a dark country road. You know, the kids trying to get their groove on and thing. Well, in fact, actually, um, some folks claim that the infamous campfire tale of the couple who's making out in their car and they hear the report on the radio, of the hook-handed killer, he's loose, right? Yeah, remember that? She pitches a bitch and makes the boyfriend drive them out of there and eventually they stop and they find this bloody hook hanging from the back door. Yeah, that legend. That legend, folks, they say can be traced back to the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. Makes sense to me, right? So... This killer was described by witnesses, yes, there were witnesses, as a big dude wearing a white mask or a sack with eye holes. So authorities know that he killed five people in 10 weeks, but they suspected about three times more than those, just never were able to make the connections. But your boy was sloppy, like I said, witnesses. Three, as a matter of fact. Among those three was actually the first couple. So that attack went down on February 22nd, 1946. Our horny little couple went out that night. They were parked at the end of a secluded country road. His name was Jimmy Hollis and her name was Mary Jean Larry. Well, they were shocked as hell when this dude comes staggering out of the woods, shining a flashlight in their face, right? Well, by the time they figured out what was going on, the phantom was pointing a gun at them. So he holds him, uh, he tells him to get out of the car and he winds up holding him hostage there for a little while. And then he tells Hollis to drop his pants. Well, when he did, um, the Phantom beat the piss out of him and poor Hollis is laying on the ground with the blood coming out of his head because he's got a serious skull fracture. Well, by the time he's through beating the hell out of Hollis, he tells Mary Jean to run. So she hauls ass towards the ditch. And he's hollering at her, telling her, no, run the other direction. Well, the other direction was toward the road. She's like, okay, I'm good with that. <laughs> so she starts heading, that, hauling ass towards the road. And he decides he's going to chase her down at that point. Well, he catches her, he tackles her, and he rapes her. But then he lets her go again. Um, so Hollis and Larry actually survive. Um, but all of the others, except for one, of course, weren't so lucky. Now, the next month in March, Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore were found dead in their parked car at the end of a secluded road. And a few weeks later, they were joined by Paul Martin and Betty Jo Booker. Booker was the Phantom's youngest victim at only 15 years old. Now, in the, week of, uh, the first week of May, the Phantom Killer attacked what were known as his last official victims. Um, it was a husband and a wife. 
I'm sorry. It was a husband and a wife and a, a farm just on the other side of town. The husband's name was uh, Virgil Starks. He was killed by uh, two gunshots to the back of the head. But his wife, Katie, survived despite the fact she was shot twice in the face and had to run to the nearest neighbor's house in order to get help. When the Phantom was on the loose, Texarkana was like a city under siege. Um, everybody and their grandmama was packing and everybody was just waiting for this phantom to jump out of the bushes at them. The authorities had set town curfews and they even canceled the evening uh, services at all the surrounding churches. And then the murders just stopped all of a sudden. So despite all the combined efforts of law enforcement, no arrest was ever made. But there were a few suspects. Check this out. Um, a lot of folks believe that this local name, Yule Swinney, had been arrested in 1947 for auto theft. Uh, they thought he was the murderer. His wife even actually accused him as well, but by law, because she was his wife, she couldn't testify against him. Shortly after she accused him, she recanted. So I guess she was just pissed off that week or something. I don't know, but I can kind of relate to that. Um, anyway... Uh, regardless, Swinney was in jail a whole lot more than he was out, in, at least up until 1973. He actually died in 1994, but he never implicated himself in the murders. Now, in 1999 and in 2000, this anonymous woman starts contacting all of the surviving family members from the Phantom's victims. Um, she was contacting them and apologizing for what her father had done to their families. But Yul Swinney never had a daughter. So somebody out there knows who this guy was. At least they did in 99 and 2000, but we still don't know as far as the general public. Regardless who the killer uh, was, this town that he traumatized has never been the same since all this bloody killing spree of his. Now, some towns would try to cover it up and, for, and forget about this gruesome legacy that's there, but Texarkana kind of embraced it. Um, when the town that dreaded sundown was filmed there in 1976, all the locals were cast in the movie as extras. And every year around Halloween, the movie is screened at Spring Lake Park, near where one of the murders actually took place. Sounds like my kind of town, right? Um, <laughs> Hey, Amanda, good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. So next up, we've got just enough time, I think, to squeeze this one in. So I'm going to try to get it out real quick. Um, this next one is one of my all-time favorites, Child's Play. Love me some Chucky, y'all. This film was based off of stories about a haunted doll named Robert. So Robert was this hand-sewn doll that looks to be about three feet tall. His eyes are these black orbs sewn into this scantily featured face, and he's dressed in this cute little sailor suit and even has a hat. Um, the doll was given to the son of Thomas Otto by a servant that he'd fire that he'd known to practice witchcraft. Now the boy decides he's going to name the doll after himself, and the two of them became inseparable after that. Now it's normal for kids to have these little pretend friends. Roberts just happened to be a doll. Or was it? Um, it was said that Robert would stay in his room for hours on end with this doll. And when his mom went to the door to go check on him, she could distinctly hear two voices, her son Robert's and something else. So things start happening all over the house. Odd things would turn up missing and they'd be found in weird places and things would be broken. And it always seemed like Robert the doll had this thing for destroying stuffed animals as well. Visitors and family had seen him running up the stairs and they'd seen him taunting folks, mostly kids, from upstairs in one of the windows as they're walking by the sidewalk outside. So plenty of folks had heard him walking around. Plenty of folks had heard him giggling. Oh, and check this out. So this wicked looking little doll creeps up behind a plumber that was there working one day. And he sits on the floor and just starts laughing his ass off at him. Robert was probably laughing at his ass crack, right? Well, anyway, that dude hauled ass out of the house in the middle of the job, left his tools and everything, and never went back. So anyway, at some point, the kid's parents take the doll away from him, and they store it in the attic. Well, he didn't like being up in the attic. In fact, he kept popping up all over the house, and they had to keep taking him back up to the attic. Several times that happened. 
Eventually things settled down somewhat, but there were always these occasional bumps in the night or wicked giggling seeping through the walls. But eventually Robert, the kid, grew up, moved away and got married. Now when his parents died, he inherits the house and he rediscovers the doll. Well, the wife hates the creepy looking little bastard, but Robert's already been sucked back in. He's grown reattached to the doll, which at this point, Robert's claiming the doll needs a room of his own with a window that faces the street. But the wife, she eventually wins out and the doll goes back into the attic. Again, it has to be taken back and forth to the attic several times because he keeps turning up all over the freaking house. And of course, there's the occasional bumping around and giggling coming from above. Well, in 1972, Robert dies, and the house is sold to another family with a 10-year-old kid. So the girl finds the doll and starts this whole shitstorm all over again. But these parents were just a little bit smarter, though. When enough misfortune had plagued their home, they donated Robert to the Key West Martello Museum, where today he actually is still there sitting behind a glass case most of the time when he's not tapping on the glass or giggling at the people as they walk by him. Now, Robert's known to turn the lights on after hours, and it is a very well-known fact among the staff that he walks around the museum as he sees fit at night, because every single day his feet are dusty, no matter how many times they're clean. All right, folks, so I hope you guys enjoyed the show. A lot of little creepy tales for you tonight. As always, there'll be more creepy tales next week. But I tell you what, if you can't hold out and you got to get your scary on between now and next Monday night, go to authorlynngibson.com. You can find my books there, my blogs there. You can stalk me on Facebook there. You can see pictures from uh, past events, and you can see the 2018 Adrian's Fury dragster schedule which is going to be manic this year our season actually kicks off in a couple weeks here big johnny glender's got her lined up to be at a, a racetrack somewhere hell i don't even know you'll have to catch that on whiskey cars and cigars but i can tell you at the end of february 23rd through 26th i believe pensacon is on we will be there we are so stoked the guest list is just crazy insane, and it's growing every day. That's going to be one hell of a party. So start putting your nickels and your pennies away, folks. Make sure you get those tickets. Come on out and see us at Pensacon. Hang out with the Adrian's Fury Dragster. Come see me. Come slap Big Johnny Blender up against the head, because he needs that every once in a while. And my hands are old and tired, so I'd appreciate a little backup on that. All right, folks, thanks for hanging with me. I'll see you guys again Monday. Um, catch my blog on Friday. You can find that on Facebook at Southern Horror Queen. And until then, folks, y'all keep it creepy because you know good and damn well I will. Good night, y'all.